<coughs> make a slight change. So I'm not going to make the presentation I was going to make in the third session because, again, the files are all corrupted. And crash course in Greek is really not what we are here for. So uh, instead, and it sort of gave me a good idea as well, he said the third session of the day, which is just after lunch, I think the project sessions probably get you excited because you're all talking to each other doing things. But this is the hardest session. You know, just after lunch, stomach is hopefully full and napping. It's a nice, Bangalore weather is nice. You'd rather be napping. But unfortunately, you have to be here. So I'll, I'll talk what I call a slow, you know, there's a slow food movement. How many of you have heard of the slow food movement? Right, slow food means exactly what you think slow food. So you, instead of just gobbling up your food in about two minutes, you spend time you, you spend time cooking and spend time eating the food. And so the same ideas, it's not a bad thing when it comes to thinking. So this is your, our slow thinking session. Right, so every, so as it so turns out by accident, yesterday also the afternoon session, I didn't use the PowerPoints. So we will keep this session for thinking slowly through some fundamental issues rather than quickly through a whole range of material. So the first two is like, you know, we can be fast out of the block in the morning and sort of ease into a project session in the afternoon. Okay? Um, and there's a reason behind that. Like, one great advantage of the scheme that I mentioned yesterday, you know, computation, modularity, brain circuits, evolution, is that it's a beautiful scheme you can use to analyze anything, but, and since you can do it for everything, it's very easy to say, okay, computational models of memory, attention, uh, you know, shape perception, and emotion, everything, so, it becomes almost mechanical in the hurry in which you start thinking about the mind and we lose sight of some of the fundamental questions. And the fact of the matter is, again, it's the fundamental questions that should drive the field, if not all the time, at least some of the time, and the fundamental questions are not answered. Right? It's, it's not as if we really know how everything works, and it's just a matter of dotting the I's and crossing the T's. We don't even know how to address some of the most basic questions. In fact, some of the most basic questions are answered more by omission than by commission. What do I mean by that? You can pretend that certain so certain issues don't exist. Like for the longest time, people pretended as if consciousness doesn't exist. So we don't need to study it. And that is as true of behaviorism as it was of the traditional computational account. Because behaviorism says either it doesn't exist or even if it exists, I can't study it, so I don't care. Computationalists replace the study of subconscious sort of mental processes by unconscious computational systems. See, in both cases, the study of experience and consciousness suffers because nobody thinks it's interesting. But that's not really why uh, most of us get into the study of the mind. Because as I started this summer school, it is that direct first person experience of the world that actually fascinates, that is to us our very existence. Right? So to be a mental conscious being is to be an experiential being. And so any exploration of the mind which somehow rejects consciousness is at some point just not the study of the mind. It is something else. I still remember, um, and I have told this story so many times, I think that people have heard it earlier in their uh, years. Uh, when I was a first year student uh, at MIT, there was, um, there was always every year a lecture called the Teuber Lecture. It was the flagship lecture of the year. The students had to invite a distinguished speaker. So this was the most important uh, event of the year as far as the department was concerned. And we, on both sides, the Teuber lecturer was honored for being the Teuber lecturer and the department was 
always excited about hearing someone who we really, really wanted to hear. So the person we invited that year, in my first year, I, uh, and I was a student representative, so I got to be part of this process, was B.S. Ramachandran. Okay, and that was just when, in fact, he had not even written Phantoms in the Brain. He had only started that work. It was in papers, but I think the book had not yet come out. So this was, you know, while his star was rising very fast. And uh, so V.S. Ramachandran uh, came, and I was in the brain and cognitive science department. He was the person invited to give the Torba lecture. So the idea was that students would take him out for lunch and spend a long lunch with him discussing various topics. And the brain and cognitive science department had two factions to it, the brain faction and the cognition faction. And the two were in different buildings and they didn't really talk to each other. Okay? So B.S. Ramachandran comes and we take him out for lunch to a nice restaurant and after the wine and everything has been drunk. Um, so we start talking about the mind. And the first thing that one of my classmates actually was in Matt Wilson's lab, so the lab that studies, um, now well known for the study of sleep in, in uh, rats and of memory, uh, hippocampal memory formation. So he said, I don't really understand what you cognition guys study. See, when we study the brain, we have a uh, measurement device and we poke it into the brain and I know what I'm studying. What is it that you guys are studying? And you can imagine what kind of reaction that that got. And we spent that entire week ignoring S. Yes, Ramachandran and arguing with each other. <laughs> right? So we, uh, but the point was that, and the response, of course, we cognitive science people gave is that it doesn't matter. You can poke the pancreas and you can poke the brain. As far as things that are pokeable go, there's really no, not that much difference between the two. Right? But you're not here to study the pancreas. So you have to study the brain. Where did you get this idea that it's the brain that is worth studying? So, in some sense, the hard end of the field is stuff that you can poke and prod. But the soft end of the field is what gives you what is worth poking and prodding. And if you lose sight of the latter, you don't necessarily ask the right questions. This summer school is as much about the questions as about the answers. I don't want to you to leave thinking it's all done. Right? In fact, I want you to leave thinking there are really interesting questions and there are a bunch of really stupid people working in it, so I can just come and clean it all up because I'm way smarter than all these guys who are doing this work. That's how actually graduate students are supposed to think. Right? That, uh, these old guys don't have any idea of how to do their work. We have a once in a while. That's not a bad attitude. No. So, uh, huh? Sorry? The problem is that we should not be more, you know, extra smart because, you know, without understanding them properly, we mm -hmm. should not uh, think that, you know, uh, the only thing I do that is make that. I mean, I wish I could. I mean, I think you are right. But I've lived my entire life sort of not believing that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense, uh, uh, in fact, I got exactly the opposite advice, not from a fellow student, but from a very, very distinguished senior person who was on my thesis committee. He basically told me that because I was doing a theory thesis in an experimental department, that there are only two ways this is this is going to work out. You are going to go in front of them, they are going to think, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, he's asked some uninteresting questions, and he has thought of answers that I could think of anyway, so I'm going to trash him. And he didn't even collect data. Right? So at least, if you're not smart, if you collect data, you have something on your side. The other possibility, if you're a theorist, is you come across as someone who is a lot smarter than the person who is listening to you and they have to desperately try to catch up with you. If you get them in that stage, you are through. So that was the, that was the advice he gave me. That 
you may have to make sure that the last 20 minutes of a presentation are completely ununderstandable to your audience, even though they know that until then you have asked interesting things and therefore there must be something interesting coming after that. It's just that I'm not smart enough to understand. <laughs> so, so it's not a, you know, This is just academic chess. You can think about it that way. <laughs> Um, but that's not what we are talking about here. Uh, we are talking about consciousness. Why is consciousness so interesting? Why are other such questions so compelling and interesting? It's not a surprise that people across the world have thought about experiencing consciousness because at some level it is. It is coterminous with being human. If we were not conscious, we would not be who we are. I mean, it's certainly impossible for us to be something which is not conscious. And Descartes formalizes that in Cogito Resume, but without being experiential beings, uh, we are not beings. I don't know what, what other things are conscious. So this is another question. Most people for, for the last three, four hundred years have assumed that other species aren't conscious, that they are not really beings, they're just machines. Descartes actually is very responsible, or at least he's the one who states that thesis most powerfully, right? Um, and he points out to the human possession of language as the thing that really distinguishes us from um, other species. Everything else is mechanical except for language. But the more you find out, and not just through evolutionary biology, of course evolutionary biology tells us that we are a lot like other animals. But that could go either way, right? It could go into us being machines, or it could go into them being equally non-machines. Uh, we also have changed our ideas of what a machine is radically from the time that Descartes was thinking about machines. When Descartes, there's a, I forgot the name of the book, this beautiful book, which I only read parts of it because you know, I was traveling, and which is a history of machines in the 17th century. See, one of the things that, I mean, we now think of machines as stuff that is mass produced. Right? I mean, most machines that we encounter are machines that are produced usually in the tens of millions. So your phones, your cars, whatever. These are, for us, the industrial uh, production of machines is what a machine is. A machine is something that's made on an assembly line with many, many other machines. But in Descartes' time and the early sort of era of uh, the European Enlightenment, machines were crafted materials. People used to make them very, very carefully one at a time. Right? So a mechanical engineer then was an artist, not an uh, industrial uh, professional. And people made some beautiful machines at that time. So the French king's garden in, in, in Versailles was full of these things. So you would go into that garden and suddenly some entity would walk toward you. Right? And so this mechanical menagerie was actually the impulse for a great deal of this philosophizing that happens because these things were so beautiful. It's like, like the Salarjan Museum in uh, Hyderabad, if you've seen the clocks there. Right? Some of those clocks are pretty amazing. You see them, like there's something is shaking there, another thing there. Everything seems to be sort of orchestrated in this beautiful manner, and that's what, that magic of the machine is gone for us. I mean, maybe if you watch Star Trek, you can think only when you send things out into space or uh, go into subatomic sub uh, regions that machines become magical for us now. But at that time, any machine, anything that just walked from one end of the room to another was magical, because people were not producing those things before. So that idea that somehow just through levers and pulleys you could make something that behaves like a human being was sort of that moment when people realized that maybe we are nothing besides those things. Right? And in some sense the history of the last two, three hundred years is on the one hand better and better understanding of how to make machines but at the same time, very dramatic changes in what we mean by machines themselves. Right? So one example, sort of prototypical example of a machine is something that acts because of contact. 
But a great deal of our mechanical enterprise now is powered by things that don't touch each other. So computation doesn't really happen through a form of touch. You know, it happens through electrical signals. And so the way it's propagated is not really touch in any sense. It's contact is not the crucial thing. Gravity doesn't involve contact. So spacecraft, so all the things that we think of as mechanical marvels are really not to Descartes, they won't even be machines. He would, in fact, not accept that such a thing could exist. How can something act at a distance? So the biggest uh, critique of Newton's theory of gravity, and if it has not been so predictive, was that it assumed that there was a force which could propagate through an empty space all the way from the sun to the earth. How could that happen? Which is, and then, therefore, they postulated the either. It turns out there's no either. And so an even bigger problem for any mechanical theory. Right, that there is force which is propagating through empty space. And so our idea of machines have changed a lot. But in the study of the mind, we are still stuck, in some sense, in the automaton view. So mentally, we are stuck in the 17th century of thinking about mechanisms. Right? You know, it's like there are many, many levers here, and each one moves the next one. And that lights up, and then this lights up. And, no. I, I mean, that's never going to work. It didn't work for physics. Why do you think it would work for uh, the study of the mind? So consciousness becomes a major issue only if you have this machine as the counterpart. Right? So if you don't think we are machines, on the one hand, it becomes more likely that we will study consciousness as a natural phenomenon. We're just not trying to mechanize it. Same thing with computation, right? Computation has such an important role to play only if you want to ask, how do I mechanize the processing of information? But if we are not trying to mechanize the processing of information, then information flow can be studied without the assumption that there is a computational process through which the flow happens. And this is very important. Because I'm going to state two problems here, which to me are action at a distance like problems. And I'll tell you why. 